But today we're in uh, Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 12 through 18. And uh, I'll, I'll give to you a little bit of a uh, review of what we've gone through prior to verse 12. And then we'll move into verse 12 and go through verses 12 through 18 this morning. So let's begin reading at verse 12. I'll read to verse 14, and uh, we'll begin our study. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 14. Paul writes, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now Paul has been teaching concerning the fact that a person who walks in the flesh cannot please God. He had stated that in verse 8 of chapter 8. Remember with me, he had said, So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So he's making it very clear that people walking in the flesh cannot please God. Now, when he speaks of somebody walking in the flesh, he's referring to a person who has no inward motivation to be pleasing to God. And the reason why a person walking in the flesh has no inward motivation to be pleasing to God is because his mind, his will, his emotions, all the plans that he makes will always be related to himself, what he can do and what he can get for himself. So it's not going to be a life that is intended to bring pleasure to God or to to uh, be a worshipful offering to God. It's really simply a, a life that is lived for self. Now, Jesus spoke concerning that in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and 32, where he said, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. What shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we put on? Those are the things that make up the commercials that we see every day whenever we watch TV. Where am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? What am I going to drink? Turn on a sports program and the main things you'll see are going to be hamburgers and beer. I mean, what shall I eat? What shall I drink? And so you'll also see different commercials related to what am I going to put on. Jesus said these are the things that those who don't know God are consumed by. These are the things that occupy their mind. It's all about me. What can I eat? What can I drink? What can I wear? He said, these are the things that the Gentiles, these are the things that those who don't know the Lord are always putting their minds on. These are the things that they are constantly caught up with. So he made it very clear in verse 8 that a person who doesn't have a relationship with God is always seeking satisfaction for themselves and therefore will not be pleasing to the Lord. They're walking in the flesh. They'll never be pleasing to God. They will not and they cannot be pleasing to the Lord because they don't have faith in God. They don't trust in the Lord. And Hebrews eleven six 6 says, it's, says this, it's, without faith it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so a person who walks in the flesh cannot please God because they don't exercise faith towards the Lord and therefore do not desire to be pleasing to him. Now in contrast to that person, Paul makes it clear that it's, that his readers can live with, with, with what we would call a spiritual confidence. He tells them they don't need to live according to the dictates of their sinful nature, that it is made possible to live in a way that pleases God by the Spirit of God. And so he begins to emphasize that in verses 9, 10, and 11. In verse 9, notice how he said, you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So when you've been born again, you become the temple of the Spirit of God. Now he repeats that in verse 9, 10, and 11. Verse 9 again, he says, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Verse 10, if Christ is in you. Verse 11, but if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And so he's emphasizing the fact that believers become what are called temples of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, God chose to meet with the people in some structures, one called the tabernacle, the other one referred to as the temple. And so God would meet with man in these structures. That's where he chose to meet with men. But the bottom line is, is in the New Testament, 
People no longer go to the temple to make their offerings. But in the New Testament, God himself inhabits his own temple, which is the human body. We actually become the temple of the Spirit of God. So the people no longer go to the temple so much as the temple begins to go out to the people. And so when you're saved, when God comes to dwell within you, when the Spirit of Christ is in you, when the Holy Spirit is in you, when God himself is in you, rather than us going to a certain location to make our offerings to meet with God, God has now chosen to dwell in us, and we have become the temple of the Spirit of God. This makes it different than religious practices because religious people will follow rituals and particular ordinances of their organized religious belief system, but a person can be religious without having a relationship with God. And the difference is that somebody who is, is, is walking in the Spirit, who has a Spirit within them, that's what constitutes that person being a Christian. That's why when sometimes you're talking to people and they'll share with you that they're a Christian, no matter what it is that they're saying, if the Holy Spirit is not dwelling within them, they don't belong to the Lord. They are not Christians. The Bible says that God's Spirit dwells within those who believe in Him. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 6.19 Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? 1 John 4.15 Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Well, he said in verse 9, if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his, no matter what they say. No matter if they want to argue with you all day long, well, I'm a Christian, does the Spirit of God dwell in you? Now, when Jesus was speaking about this in Matthew chapter 7, in what is called the Sermon on the Mount, he was rolling to the conclusion of his message when he said in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. But I did these things in your name. I used your name when I did these works. And God says, Jesus says to them, I never knew. It's not as if we had a relationship and you stepped away. We never had a relationship at all. I never knew you. You used my name. You spoke in a religious sense. But you and I never had fellowship, you see. And so that's something that Paul is emphasizing for us. Now that comment should cause every person to have a moment for introspection. Like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. It should cause us pause for introspection. Am I the temple of the Spirit of God and does the Spirit of God dwell within me? Are you? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Spirit of God dwells within you? Do you know that? It's a very important thing to know. You see, he says in verses 10 and 11, if Christ is, Christ is in you, the body's dead because of sin. Well, he's saying, through Jesus, we who were spiritually dead have been made alive because the spirit of life is now within us. He says that in Ephesians 2, 1, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. But the spirit, according to verse 10, is life because of righteousness. So Jesus, who was righteous for us, died for us, and he took upon himself our sin. And in this, according to verse 11, by his Spirit, he gives life to our mortal bodies. So as he's been presenting that, we are the, the uh, temple of the Spirit of God, and God has given us life, and this God who raised Jesus from the dead now dwells in us. He moves into verse 12 by saying, Therefore, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. So we are under obligation. What is the obligation that I have as a Christian? Well, I am under obligation to live for God and not for my fleshly desire. I'm under obligation because I know that God purchased me with the blood of Christ. And because I know that that cost was immense, that was beyond imagination, it has caused me to humbly say to God, I am your servant. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, you were bought at a price. 
Therefore, honor God with your body and your spirit, which belong to God. He purchased you. He's saying we at one time were in the marketplace of sin. We were sold into bondage of slavery, and slavery was sin. But Jesus Christ came, and Jesus Christ paid that price for us. He ransomed us. He purchased us with his own blood. I was bought at a price. The price, the scripture says, is the blood of Christ. I was purchased by God. Jesus Christ's blood was the currency, and he ransomed me. And seeing that I am bought at a price, I now have committed myself to God, and I serve him with this body that was purchased by him. So we honor God with our body and our spirit, which belong to him. And so he goes on in verse 13 to say, for if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, he said, you will live. And so he's speaking of unbelievers. An unbeliever will come under God's judgment because they haven't received the gift of eternal life. They didn't become the temple of the Spirit of God. But when you get saved, the Spirit of God now is in you. And, and he says in verse 13, uh, by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, and he said, therefore you will live. So being filled with God's Spirit gives us strength to no longer live carnally, feeding on the flesh. This all is wrapped up in verse 14 when he says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. We'll spend some time here looking at that phrase. Being led. Notice verse 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Being led speaks of a personal intimacy with the Spirit of God. Now, Paul was writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, and he said this. He said, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Now, you can, you can be a person, you can go to a church where you learn this, you can be a person who understands the grace of God. And so he closes by saying, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can go and you can say, I know what grace is. Grace is the unmerited favor that God has given to me. It is by grace that I have been saved through faith that not of myself is a gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. God has poured out his grace on me because because Moses brought the law, but grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. And so God has given to me unmerited favor, and I can have a relationship with God through the grace of God by faith, and you can understand that, and you can speak of that. Paul has been writing about that all through Romans, especially the last few chapters, and has been emphasizing for his readers the, the um, uh, uh, incredible amount of grace that God has given to us. And so we can speak concerning the grace of Jesus Christ. You're also capable of speaking of the love of God. God is love. The Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were sinners, yet, yet while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. John said, he who loves not knows not God. We could speak about the love of God all day long and how God has demonstrated, how he poured it out on us. How that the evidence that a person has been saved is the fact that he has the fruit of the Spirit. She has the fruit of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is love. And you can speak about the love of God, how it was poured out into our hearts, how it's been shed abroad, and, and all of that. We can speak about the grace of Jesus Christ. We can speak about the love of God, and we can speak with understanding and certainty. But here's the problem. Not everybody can speak concerning the communion of the Holy Spirit. There are those who can give great studies on grace and great studies on love, but they haven't got a real understanding of the communion or fellowship or partaking of the Holy Spirit. And that is what makes the difference in your life, is learning to be led by the Spirit of God. That's what makes the difference. It's not that I can conceptually understand things like grace and things like love. It's the intimacy of fellowship with the Spirit that actually is transforming my life. It's learning to hear the Spirit's still small voice when he speaks through the word or when he begins to lead me within myself and gives me internal motivation and direction 
that I know lines up with Scripture and that I can see is actually coming from the Lord. It's an intimacy and a communion that develops over time. Several years ago now, I was driving. Marie and I were on our way to do some ministry uh, in the Glendale area. And I was driving in the fast lane, but there's no traffic around me at all. It was one of those miraculous moments on the freeway when you're basically the only car there, and I was enjoying it. There's nobody around, nobody in front of us, nobody behind us, and we were just driving and we were visiting. And as we were speaking, for no reason whatsoever, and I was in the fast lane, for no reason whatsoever, I felt a prompting to change lanes from the fast lane to the middle lane to the slow lane. Now, I never go into the slow lane. I have to be honest with you. I don't drive in the slow lane unless I'm getting off the freeway. I never drive in there because sometimes when people are entering the freeway, they're not going fast enough, and it can be dangerous. I mean, I'm going 150 miles an hour. Get out of my way. I'm in the slow lane. But as I'm, as I'm driving, I never go in the slow lane. My dad was a truck driver, and he taught me a long time ago, stay out of the slow lane. It's a dangerous lane, stay in the middle lane or in the fast lane. So he taught me that years ago, and that's what I practiced all my years of driving. And so there's no re reason for me to be in the slow lane. None at all. There's no traffic. But as I'm driving, for some reason, I just decide to move into the slow lane. And I'm telling you before the Lord, as I moved into the slow lane, not 30 seconds later, coming in the opposite direction, bursting through a chain link fence that was separating the freeway, just a chain link fence, comes a stake bed truck traveling about 70 miles an hour who blew through the chain link fence from his side and shot into the fast lane where I had just occupied. And had I remained in that fast lane, I would have encountered head on this particular truck that had had an accident of some sort and shot through that chain link fence and then moved on back and through the fence once again shot across and entered back onto his side of the freeway. And I turned to Marie and I looked at her and I said, whoa, that's all I could muster up. That was close. Holy Spirit, he'll move you sometimes. You're not even realizing that he is moving you and you just sense that God is moving you. I was in church on one Sunday before I was pastoring this church um, before I was actually in full-time ministry, and I had gone to church, and my cousin Ray was seated next to me during the services, and the invitation came, and when the uh, pastor said, for those who want to get right with God and receive Christ, I encourage you to come forward and stand up here and, uh, and receive the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord began to speak to my heart, but I didn't recognize him. And, uh, and I thought, you ought to ask Ray if he wants to go up and get saved. And then I thought, no, I'm, no, no, I'd be just kind of pressuring him. I'm just going to be pushing him. No, I can't do that. This has got to be just my flesh. This can't be the spirit. So I didn't say anything to him. And so we go home, and he was living at my parents' house at that time, and, and we were seated across from one another. And he looks me in the eye as we were there at my kitchen table, my parents' kitchen table, and he says to me, you know, when the pastor gave that invitation to get saved today, he said, I was waiting for you to tap me on the shoulder and to tell me that you would go up with me because I wanted to get saved today. And I said, no, you have to go to hell now for sure. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I felt so bad. I led him to the Lord there at the kitchen table, but I have to tell you, it's t this was 38, almost 39 years ago, but obviously I haven't forgotten that, that the Holy Spirit will prompt you. There are times when the Holy Spirit is prompting you. We need to learn the voice of the Spirit. I can speak to you all day long about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I can speak to you about the love of God. But Paul said, may the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you also. The Trinity working in unity within you, the Holy Spirit leading you. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, Paul says, these are the sons of God. So it's not the religious practice that I might have partaken in as a youth. It is being born again, being the temple of the Spirit of God who dwells within me and now begins to lead me in the paths of righteousness. The Holy Spirit leads us in our daily lives through communion with Him. Somebody once asked the question, 
Is it possible that a person might be a partaker of the Holy Spirit and not know it? That they are filled with His light and love and not know it? That they have the spirit of adoption by which they cry, Abba, Father, and yet know nothing of their personal relationship to God? In a word, that they fully experience the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit and not know it? This is all as absurd as it is impossible. You will know. You will know. Does the Spirit of God dwell in you? You will know. And if there's a question about that, perhaps he doesn't, which is why Paul said, examine yourselves. Is the Lord Christ in you? Or are you simply going through the motions? A great thing to ask because if you want all of the Lord, if you have a desire for Him, if you want to know Him, it's a good, a good indicator that you have a relationship with, with Him. How do you know when it's the Holy Spirit leading you? How do you know that you're being led by the Spirit? A friend of mine is a pastor, a Calvary pastor, and he shares the story of how that on one Sunday, his wife was seated in the congregation there and some young man approached his wife and said to her that he'd been praying since he first saw her. He didn't know her from anybody. He was relatively new to the church, obviously. And he said, when I saw you, I began to pray. And God has led me to tell you that you're supposed to be my wife. Now, he's saying that to the pastor's wife. <laughs> and so she said, okay. And she left the pastor and now they're off somewhere in Tallahassee, Florida. No, I, she said, I'm sorry, but I'm already taken. The Holy Spirit already spoke to my husband years ago. And uh, so how do you know? How do you know when it's the Holy Spirit and not salsa? How do you know that? I have a warm, burning sensation in my heart. Yeah, you ate too much salsa. How do you know the Holy Spirit is leading and not? Well, basically, this communion with the Spirit, it comes through just spending time with the Lord in prayer, spending time in God's Word, and it's developed through having godly fellowship. It's through learning to wait on the Lord as you read your devotions, not speed reading through the Bible, not saying, oh, I'm going to read the Bible through in the year, therefore I have to read these five chapters today of this and four chapters here. It's taking your time as you go through the Word and finding a passage that speaks to your heart. And then you close your Bible for a moment, you meditate on that, and you say, Lord, this is what you did in the life of Elijah. This is what you did in David. This is what you did with Saul. This is what you did with, uh, with the Apostle Peter. And, and Lord, I'm asking, give me some insight. It's, it's, it's just working your way through Scripture and waiting on the Lord as He trains you up. It's getting in the Word. It's being in prayer. It's seeking God's Spirit. It's having godly friends that you speak to and have fellowship with. And it's an awareness that the Spirit always leads you to obey God's Word that you may glorify Jesus Christ. He will never lead you to a bar to get drunk with your friends so you can share Jesus with them. I've had people say that to me. Well, you know, the Lord led me to go and have a few beers with my friends. No, He didn't. No, He didn't. Coors did. Or Heineken, you might... Or maybe you're German, you like Beck. But whoever, it wasn't the Spirit. That's your flesh. Oh, I knew of somebody who went into strip joints to minister to the women. I joined him a few times. That's another story. No, I, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm lying. People live in the flesh and blame the Spirit. That happens all the time. God led me to do this. God led me to do that. And it's a sinful thing. God led me to talk about you to somebody else because you need to be humbled. It's a sinful thing. So you, you have to line it up with Scripture. Does the Word of God give you evidence that this is how God works? You line it up in prayer. Father, I have a sense that you're speaking to my heart concerning this. Is this your will for us? Is this what I'm supposed to do? It comes through godly uh, uh, wisdom that you can ask your friends and say, listen, I'm praying about this and I'm praying about that and it seems that the Spirit of the Lord is leading you in this, me in this, but I don't want to do this without any advice that, that perhaps you can give me so I can put it in the mix of my prayers and, and seek God in. And that's how it works. 
And it always is intended to bring glory to Jesus Christ. Always. Now, notice how he says in verse 15, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You didn't receive the spirit of bondage. Bondage to sin results in a life filled with fear. We pray and we say, God, give us this day our daily bread. Father, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Father, guide us today. And, and you pray and, and we say, Lord, but I do need your provisions, God, because I don't want to be anxious for Scripture says be anxious for nothing. I don't want to be anxious because Jesus taught me that by worrying I can't change my, my, the color of my hair and, and, and my own physical height. I have to trust in you, Lord. And so bondage to sin results in a life that's filled with fear. So we ask God to provide for our daily needs, the necessities of our life. And also, somebody who doesn't have the Spirit of God can be in bondage to the fear of judgment, final judgment. They're never sure as to whether or not they're right with God. They're always wondering whether or not they have actually committed themselves to God, and they're always concerned about that. Now, in the United States, there's a general response to the question I'm about to ask, and, and it's this. If I were to say to somebody here in the, in the States, in California, but this is true pretty much anywhere here in the States, if I said, can you tell me the opposite can you tell me the opposite of love? The average person would say that the opposite of love is what? Hate, right? All of us in this room, right? What is the opposite of love? Hate. Is that biblically true? The answer is no. That's not biblically true at all. The opposite of love in Scripture is not hate. The opposite of love in Scripture is fear. How do I know that? 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. The reason that fear is the opposite of love is because a person who's committed to Christ has no fear of torment, has no fear of the coming judgment. See, when I go home to be with the Lord and I, if God gives to me opportunity to, to die in a bed and, and with people coming to say goodbye and all, you're not going to hear me. The person who visits me is not going to hear me saying, I hope I get to heaven. You're not going to hear that. Why? Because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because my walk with God has been ensured by him and his spirit. Because by grace, I've been saved. And so I'll be saying my goodbyes, but it won't be like, oh, I hope I make it through those pearly gates. No, I've got one waiting for me who said to me, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's a promise from God. And see, I can trust in that. <laughs> Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Absent. That's why Paul said, that, he, that he, was, he was desirous to be in a better place. Why? He said to depart is far better. Why? Because he's going to be with Jesus Christ. So any believer does not have to fear on their deathbed. You don't have to lay there going, oh, I hope I make it. Oh, I hope I make it. Because if you have that attitude, you're not going to. But I'm entering into heaven because, not because I tried hard, but because he succeeded. He succeeded. And so I trust in the one who succeeded. I trust in Jesus Christ. And therefore, I have no fear of death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? I don't have that concern because God has caused us to triumph in Jesus Christ, you see. And so perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. And he who fears has not been made mature or perfect in love. So we have a relationship with the God of love who gives to us an awareness that our future is in his hands. And that comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. So we did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. We received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The word Abba is what is called a diminutive. It, it speaks of not father, but daddy. 
It's a word that a child calls their, their papa, their daddy. It's a, it's a tender word, and he's saying that we have the spirit of adoption. We have been brought into the family of Christ. He chose us. He adopted us. During the time of Christ, when Romans would adopt, they would adopt not children. The Romans adopted adults. They wanted to see how that person turned out before they called them their son. And they would choose them once they were mature and sh showing forth the fruit of a life well lived. In adoption, the Holy Spirit, God works within us and he calls us his own. We have become his by his choice, he chose us out of this world and he brought us into his family. We were not naturally born children of God. We were naturally born sinners in rebellion to him. But through Jesus Christ, he saved us and brought us through adoption into his family. He chose us. The little girl is playing with one of her cousins when her cousin says to her, you realize, of course, that your mommy and your daddy are not your real mommy and daddy. They adopted you. And the little girl doesn't know what adoption is. And she says, what do you mean they adopted me? No, you were born to somebody else. And your mommy and your daddy came and they, they adopted you out of a, an orphanage. And it just cut to the little girl's heart. And she goes and speaks to her parents. And, and she says to her parents that her cousin has said she's adopted. She goes, what's that mean? They say that you're not really my mom and my dad, that I was born to somebody else. And and you came and got me. And so the father and mother who were planning on sharing with her that she was an adopted baby explained how much they loved her, how they had gone to a home, how they had seen her, and how they fell in love with her and they made a choice to ask for her. They went through the process of being able to adopt her, brought her home, and they said, we brought you home, we adopted you, but we love you, we chose you, you belong to us, you're our baby. So the little girl could hardly wait to see her cousin again. She went to see her cousin. She said, you know, my mom and dad said that I am adopted, and I am. She says, I'm adopted. She said, but you know what? My mom and my dad chose me. Your mom and your dad are stuck with you. <laughs> I've always liked that story because it's, it's mean, but it's fun. God adopted us, and by his spirit, we call him daddy. When my father was going home to be with the Lord, he had a massive heart attack, and I went to the hospital, and as I was in the hospital, he was in a lot of pain, and so the nurse attending him in the, the emergency room there said uh, to me, your father's in a lot of pain, but I cannot just give him a medication to relieve his pain without his permission. And your father, because he has tubes down his throat, cannot respond to me, and I'm not authorized to really ask. It has to be somebody like yourself. Could you go and ask your father whether or not we can administer some pain medication? And I went and I to his, to his bed there, and indeed he had these tubes and everything and running down his throat, and and I put my mouth near my father's ear, and my dad was in so much pain, and, and I whispered into his ear, and, and I said to him, Daddy, they want to give you medication. Is it okay? And my dad said, he nodded a little. He actually blinked, and, and I say that to say this. The word Daddy is much more special and precious to me, and that's what I called my father. I didn't ever say Father. Now, some people do. Oh, Father, you know, but I... I <laughs> I never did that, you know, you know. Your child walks up to you, oh, blessed mother that you are, may I, you know. That is so corny and not real. But, but, but or maybe some of you do, maybe you like to call them mother. You know, I don't know, and, and father. I, 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 don't, I don't do that, you know. I, I've been around people who pray like that. They'll be talking just like I am right now, and before you know it, they'll say, would you say grace? And, oh, most heavenly father, you know. And I'm thinking, well, who are you talking to, man? I mean, you know, come on, he's daddy, he's papa. I mean, but please, you know, the scripture tells me, and, and this is something to get your mind around, and it might help you a little bit in your relationship with God. It may help you when you think of this. If you had a father that you could call daddy, some didn't, I did. But if you had a father that you could call daddy because of that love that you have for him, 
your heavenly father is also your daddy. And if you had somebody in your life that you never even wanted to call that, well, I would tell you that your God is daddy to you. We have taken that word daddy and we have depreciated it to such a point that people are almost ashamed to say that. Who's your daddy? You know, we, we do that and it causes people to take the word and, and look at it as a garbage word. And it's not. It's a tender word. It's what your baby calls you. If you go to Israel and you're walking the streets of Israel, you hear the little Jewish baby speaking to their father and they say, Abba. You'll hear him say it, Abba. And that's daddy. And that's what he's saying here. If we could get this in our heart, it would change our lives. He is saying, he has given you the spirit of adoption, whereby by his spirit, you can call him daddy, father. Now that is something worth being blessed about. He's my daddy. He's my father. He loves me. And on Father's Day, of course, we say to him, we love you, my father, my daddy. And so that comes through the Spirit. And he says in verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. We are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The Holy Spirit has made us his. So Paul is saying we are heirs of God. All he is is now mine and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What Jesus has belongs to me now because I'm a son of God. That's beyond comprehension. I'm a co-heir with Christ. Therefore, the sufferings that we go through, he said, they're not even worthy to talk about. Paul, you could have spoken a lot about suffering. Shipwrecked. Beaten. Stripes three times. Beaten with rods imprisoned, stoned to the point where many commentators believe that he actually, actually died, but God resurrected him. If anybody ever went through suffering, it's the Apostle Paul. Americans don't understand suffering at all. All you need to do is step out of the comfort zone of America step into India for a while. I've spent a month in India. Go to the Philippines. There are many neighborhoods in Mexico that you go through and you see the poverty and the pain. Haiti. There's so much pain throughout this world. So much poverty. So much suffering. And then you have people say, oh, I'm really suffering for the Lord. Really? What happened? Well, my co-workers told me I'm a Bible thumper and it just hurts so bad. Oh, really? You poor baby. Poor baby. I was in a church service in India and they have a time of sharing. What did you go through this week? What persecution did you endure? I'll never forget the woman standing up. Her left eye was closed and bruised because she said, my husband beat me up because I follow Jesus Christ. There she is in church sharing others who'd been beaten, others who'd been harmed, so many, and that is a daily routine, so much so in the life of the believers of this particular church that they actually have testimony time where the pastor says, what did you go through this week for the faith of Jesus Christ? And here in the United States, we say, oh, I'm just going through so much pain. I'm going through so much suffering. No, we're not. We don't know anything about it. And we won't know anything about it until we go out into a mission field or we go into some city or we go into some place and sometimes even go and visit our own relatives who are going through so much pain and then we discover what suffering is. That's when you discover it. You know, I grew up in a family, I won't make a big long monologue about this, but I grew up in a family where we used to go out regularly to go take care of my cousins and my mom's nieces because my aunt at that time was an alcoholic and she and her alcoholic husband didn't care for the family and we would go on a weekly basis and clean the house and take care of the kids because my aunt was so addicted to alcohol she couldn't take care of her kids. One of her sons died of heroin overdose. The other daughter was a heroin addict who went into, had to go into a place to, to be dried up and, and we saw this. I grew up seeing this. 
when, when Marie came and met my family, when she first met my family, my parents went home and two cousins were there. And as they were sit, seated there in my, in my kitchen table, one of my cousins is telling me about her husband who's in prison for killing somebody. And she's saying, well, he didn't really kill him. They just said he killed him. And I'm thinking, oh, welcome to the family, Marie. Family of murderers and drug addicts. And Marie is sitting, I had just started dating her, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm actually uneasy. I mean, this is my family. I can handle it. I know where they're coming from. They're my cousins. I love them. But this woman here doesn't know them. And I turn and I look at Marie like, I'm saying, welcome. And, and, and she's crying. Marie's crying for my cousins. And the Spirit of the Lord speaks to my heart and says, this is the woman for you. She cries for the hurt. You need somebody like that in your life. Someone who knows how to cry, and it doesn't become just a, yeah, I know. But yes, this hurts, right? Suffering. What do we know about it? What do we know about it? Very little. But Paul said the suffering of this age is nothing compared to what God has for us. Nothing compared to it. We are co-heirs with Christ and heirs of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in us. What a life God has given to us. Yes, we go through pain. Yes, we hurt. Yes, we grieve. Yes. My mama went home to the Lord. I'm blessed where she's at. Did it hurt me to bury my mother? Absolutely. I have a picture of me holding the urn with her ashes as I'm handing it to the man to bury. It hurt. Yes. Yes, it hurt. But she's with Jesus, and that gives me joy. Joy beyond the grief. Joy beyond the pain. She's with the Lord. And that is what God's all about. He gives you strength. He gives you strength. So, we have the Spirit who dwells in us. We walk in the Spirit. We commune with the Spirit. We are sons and you are daughters of God. If Christ's Spirit dwells in you, examine yourself whether that's so.